Welcome to today's webinar entitled Touching the Mind with Bodywork with Dean Juhan. This webinar is being done in collaboration with Massage and Bodywork magazine. Uh, Dean recently wrote an article of the same name, Touching the Mind, that appeared in our January-February issue. Before we introduce Dean, I'd like to share two quick announcements with you. The first one is regarding ABMP's online education center. We provide you with a really convenient way to take continuing education courses. We have currently 10 courses available, including a brand new one, just came out yesterday. It's called Massage for Fibromyalgia. It's one of nine courses that we have for two CE hours. Uh, if you're a member of ours, you do get considerable discounts. We also have webinars archived there. In fact, this webinar will be archived there. It'll probably be up by Thursday. We have to do a little conversion, and then we'll post it. And there'll be 40 webinars for you to choose from. You can listen to them for free if you're a member. And if you want to get the optional CE hour, you can purchase that for $12. I'll show you at the end of the webinar how to actually do that. I have a series of slides. The other opportunity is for the American Massage Conference. It's going to be held in Atlanta, May 20th to 22nd. It's a really affordable conference. There'll be a lot of industry professionals presenting there. And we are very happy uh, to be the global education sponsor this year. We will be hosting a number of sessions, including a session for massage students that Laura Allen will be presenting. There will also be a panel that we're sponsoring for massage professionals. So we're really excited about it. We think it's going to become the largest massage conference in America. So please check it out. For more information, you can find it at AmericanMassageConference.com. And if you do go to the American Massage Conference, you'll get to meet Leslie Young. She's our Vice President of Communication and the Editor-in-Chief of Massage and Bodywork Magazine. Leslie will be introducing Dean. Welcome, Leslie. Thank you, Brian. Dean is the author of Job's Body, a handbook for bodywork, and Touched by the Angel, the Physical, Psychological, and Spiritual Powers of Bodywork. He's also written many articles for various massage journals. Dean's been a body worker for 30 years and teaches workshops in anatomy and physiology. He was a member of the Esalen Massage Crew for 18 years and has been a practitioner and instructor of the Traeger approach for 30 years. He has a private practice in Berkeley, California. In the fall of 2005, I had the honor of meeting Dean at the first International Association of Structural Integrators Conference in Washington State he presented an inspirational, delightful keynote address and graciously turned it into a massage and bodywork feature soon after. If I could cite one text and one author who's inspired people to dedicate themselves to this profession, I would select Job's Body and Dean Juhan. Please enjoy this webinar with him. Welcome, Dean. Hello, Brian. So you're the presenter, so if you can go ahead and put your slideshow up, people will be able to All right, see it's that. There. Okay, I'm not seeing it. Leslie, what do you see over there? I see the header with the open yeah. artwork. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we have, if you could just open Keynote, Dean, we could try that again. One Keynote. I've got my... Uh, panel up here. Okay. Did you get a little box that said uh, you're accepting that you are in control? Uh, accepting I'm in control. Show my screen. Change presenter. Uh, off air. Screen sharing. Yeah. It should be a pop-up box that happens for you. Mm, I don't see it. Okay, I'll tell you what, I'm going to take back the controls and we'll try it again. Oh, I've been made the presenter. Yeah, to just uh, click show on my it. screen? Yes, please. Okay. On air showing screen. There we go. Beautiful. So Beautiful. if you could, there we go, and if you just start the slideshow, that way we'll have okay. full screen mode. Now I've got my control panel on the side. You can, they can't see that, right? That's correct. Okay, that's perfect. Okay. It's a nice shot of you, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> okay, welcome. All right. All right. You just tell me when I'm live. You are live. People are listening and ready to roll. Oh, my goodness. All right. <laughs> well, solving all these technical difficulties up to the last seconds of time. I want to say hello. This is Dean, and thank you all for logging in. Uh, this is my first webinar and an exciting forum for me to share some thoughts and perspectives that are ongoing results of 35 years of practice as a body worker and a teacher. 
The subjects I want to talk about are some of the main avenues I have experienced <clears throat> towards reaching the mind through our touch. What follows is an essay, not a systematic lesson. It will be posted online for you to repeat, viewing, and parsing. But for now, just allow the images and ideas to flow by, catching eddies in your own when they will. The sense of my bodywork sessions is that every session with a client is an island of now, a series of nows, opportunities to regather my past, a client's past, assess our present, and open up doors towards the future. The only times our mind inhabit is now. Every instance of now we flicker between three poles. Our past is redeposited upon every moment, our karma. Every moment also holds the promise of a novel experience and the possibility of embracing it, our power of choice. And every choice offers the potency of a better future, the power of grace. All of therapy is the negotiation within that moment. The possibility of bettering, bettering our lives rests upon three fundamental principles. Self-awareness, the consciousness of what we are now. Self-regulation, the ability to change, which stems from self-awareness. And successful adaptation, the ability to improve our circumstances, which stems from our self-regulation. Without reaching the mind, none of these principles are accessible. Without these, without these principles, no therapy can be effective. One of my primary teachers, Dr. Milton Traeger, helped me to understand that touch is far more than physical contact. That touch can be a language a language with its own vocabulary, grammar, and syntax, a language that can change the meaning of our lives, a language far older and deeper than word that has been evolving since long before there were neurons, let alone speech. It opens worlds of information within our organisms and between us that words will never reach. Touch is the language of the body the storyline in our drama of perception. It's worth noting that the word touch is the longest single entry in the Oxford English Dictionary. Some 14 columns of definitions and nuances of the word touch. This enormous range of meanings of touch and nuances of touch and significances of touch is a testimony, multifaceted and enduring significance of the contact of skin with skin in our lives. So let us open our drama. We are touched every moment by the force that sustains all being. Being opens to its presence, no matter what we choose to call it, is the foundation of our growth and health. And it is never even a fraction of an inch away whenever we choose to feel it. Each of our lives begins with a touch and a penetration, a fusion that transforms both parties, mother, father, yin, yang, the enterer and the entered, into a single complex unity. A unity where separations are merged, where histories combine, and where futures unfold mutually. This merging of entities, this coupling of separate histories, this inception of new possibilities is the heart and soul of all of our relationships and it is of the essence in every therapeutic negotiation. 
when flesh touches with flesh, a mutual opportunity arises. If there is no mutual intention and mutual receptiveness, nothing much will come of it. I'd like to begin by thinking about the skin, our outermost surface, that physical part of ourselves that first meets when flesh touches flesh. And the point I would like to make is that embryo embryologically and perceptively, to my way of thinking, the skin is the surface of the brain. And when we touch the skin, we, we touch the surface. And when we touch the surface, we stir the depths. I want to begin by looking at our most primitive form of skin, the cell membrane that surrounds every one of our six trillion living entities that make us up. What we are seeing is a schematic representation of a membrane. The little blue circles on the outside and the inside are phosphate heads of phospholipid molecules. The little round balls on the inside are also phosphate heads of phospholipid molecules. The little squiggly lines we see in between those two layers of blue balls are the lipid chains, hydrocarbons, that is to say oily chains of molecules that form an effective barrier, a waterproof barrier. This encapsulation is the first vessel of life. It walls off the inside from the outside. Inside, biology, biological proteins, biological change and growth. Outside, raw materials. This walling off and separation from the outside and the creation inside is the first function of our primitive skin. Now it's not enough to have a barrier between the outside and the inside. The cell is not just a mem the cell not only has a membrane, it has a membrane. What I mean by that is very quickly this enclosed capsule of life has to allow for traffic, traffic of raw materials to come into the cell to replenish the metabolic processes going on within passageways to allow metabolic wastes to be ejected so that we do not die of our own toxicity inside. And a host of molecules over time have become embedded in those cell walls. Some transporting in, some transporting out, some creating energetic connections to molecules touching the cell surface from the outside and transmitting those informa that information inward. Some giving uh, receptor molecules that hang into the inside of the cell and take energetic messages out to the surrounding world. The membrane is truly our primary source of intelligence and of discrimination. What comes in, what stays in, what goes out, what must be retained for life to continue. The cell is a smart little cookie. When we look at the development of the human embryo, we find a very interesting genesis for this thing we call skin and for this thing we call nervous system. The upper right hand, uh, upper left hand corner of this illustration shows a very early stage in the development of the fetus. On the outside layer is a differentiation of stem cells that occurs very soon in the fetal growth. It's called the ectoderm. There is a middle layer called the mesoderm. This mesoderm will go on into, to develop into bones, muscles, blood, connective tissue, all of the tissue that fills the packages between our innermost sanctum and our outermost surface. And the innermost collection of cells is called the endoderm. That will go on to form all the linings of glands, pouches, digestive tubing, and all the interior organs of my body. The thing I want to notice in this progression of fetal development from left top to right top, left bottom to right bottom, is that early in the uh, development of the fetus, part of the ectoderm, the outermost layer that will become our skin, 
changes some of its cells that we see on the top of the illustration on the upper left hand corner into differentiations from the stem cells of ectoderm into the parents that will then fold inward as we see in the upper right and as they fold inward will form a tube as we see in the lower left and as that tube differentiates from the ectoderm that will go on to become our skin, lo and behold, that infolding layer of skin is transformed into neurons and becomes our nervous system. Here is a schematic that perhaps will even make that clearer for us. In our first picture in the upper, upper left, we have the surface of the ectoderm of that developing um, fetus. In the development of that ectoderm, we form this yellow portion in the second illustration, the neural plate, which is the transfusion of what will become skin cells into cells that will become nerve cells. That neural plate in the third illustration folds inward and keeps proliferating neurons, forming a neural groove and an ever-thickening layer of neurons. Finally, that neural groove closes into the neural tube, which will become the spinal cord, which will proliferate all sensory and motor nerves out to the inner precincts of my body and develop the special little clot of neurons we call at the caudal end our brain. And the epidermis goes on to become the skin that forms the outside shell of our body. They began as one, they develop from one another and the surface of the skin is from that moment onward the surface of the brain. We are contained within this skin a big water balloon. Water is the most plentiful molecule in our body comprising somewhere between 70 to 80 percent of us depending on our body type. We are an aquatic environment and like all other aquatic env environments, behave the laws of, of the flow of water and the replenishment of water and the circulation of water and the patterns of movement that are adopted by water. The same thing happens to the water that we contain when we don't move, when we don't circulate, when we don't stimulate, as happens to the water in our sponge when we leave it on the kitchen sink for two weeks. Standing water breeds pestilence. Circulating water breeds cleansing and the motion of life. The language of water is contained within its inherent movement and within the deposits that that movement leaves behind it and in the organic shapes that those deposits take on as water swirls and whirls and flows and does its thing in nature. The primary movements of water started long before there was water collecting on our planet. All matter moves in swirls, vortexes, and currents. We see here the pattern of the stars in a galaxy forming a vortex. This vortex is repeated, nested within itself over and over and over in fractal layer after fractal layer as we come from the cosmos down to our planet and on our planet into the bodies of water that have been the cradle of our lives. Our atmosphere is just droplets of water that are suspended in the winds and the water of, in our atmosphere moves in exactly the same way in the same spirals as all other matter in the cosmos. Below our atmosphere are our oceans, the cradle of life. What we see here is a very large oceanic vortex off of a coastline that we see to the left. This vortex is many, many miles wide. And you can see in the center line of that vortex as it winds inward towards the core, little side developing vortexes that develop. And within those vortexes are smaller vortexes and within those smaller vortexes are smaller vortexes yet, 
all repeating the same pattern, all swirling in towards one another, all creating eddies that capture anything suspended in the water and give it a moment, an eon, an eternity of separation from the broader current and time to settle in and interact within itself. When we look at a smaller vortex in the surface of water, we can see that when that vortex develops enough energy, it forms a funnel that carries the surface of the water and anything suspended in that surface downward and inward. Everything that is suspended in that vortex, dissolved in the water, becomes a possible congelation substance that will not only swirl in the water, but given density and time and development, will cohere into structures that follow the shape of the swirling water. Here we see a little catch basin in stone that has been hollowed out and shaped and the lines of striation within that shape echoing the swirling vortex currents of the water that formed it. In this way, water sculpts our insides, as well as the oceans around us, the atmosphere above us, and the galaxy in which we spin. Primitive one-celled animals developing within the ocean captured this vortex shape and made themselves spirals as the most efficient way of possibly moving through the spiraling water around them. They are li literally screwing their way through the water that surrounds them in the most efficient way possible, the efficient pattern that was supplied in the first place by the template of the swirling currents of water. We see this vortex echoed in development after development as life forms took shape. On the left, is a descending stream of water in a vortex. On the right is a seashell that echoes in every stage of its growth and development, a deposit of mineral salts around that watery vortex and adopts a shape of the seashell itself, which becomes the perfect vessel for transforming the influx of water into the interior of the cell and ejecting waste material out in the most efficient manner possible, the manner that was shown to it by water in the first place. These whirlpools that descend do not just stop at the bottom, but when the energy dissipates itself at the bottom and can no longer suck downward, a larger spiral reverses itself and climbs back up out the up out the outside of the descending vortex and brings all of the water molecules back to the surface where they will again descend into the vortex, peter out with their energy at the bottom, reverse their direction and circulate towards the top. We find the most fascinating echo of these reverberating vortexes in the structure of the muscle compartments of the human heart. This is a schema of the vectors of heart muscles. We can see that the heart itself is not just a bulb that is pumping water in and out like a turkey baster, but a series of spirals spiraling inward and spiraling back outward that contract in a spiral circular contraction shape, thereby pumping water in the most blood in the most efficient possible manner from the venous system into the heart, out of the arterial system, and into the rest of the body where it joins the arteries that are themselves spiraled in their muscular construction and continue the spiraling movement of the bloodstream throughout the thousands and thousands of miles of, of circulatory vessels delivering with the utmost aqueous efficiency, nutrition and cleaning up waste materials throughout our body. Any disturbance in water any current passing through water will create these vortexes. We see here the surface of water that has been disturbed by flows coming from the little black vents that we see on the left-hand side of the picture. As that water, as that flow enters the surface of the water, 
it forms spiral after spiral, vortex after vortex. And when life forms develop within these spiral shapes and flows of form, they freeze themselves into the enduring tissue of living organisms, such as we see captured in the grain of wood. The cellulose that comprises this wood is nothing but the deposit of structural molecules around those endlessly eddying chains of the movement of water. There is another property of water. It does not just eddy, but it flows. It flows along like our life stream itself. And in that flowing, it perfectly reflects every surface under it and at the same time restructures every surface under it. We can tell from this picture which part of the flowing stream is deeper, which part is shallower. Of course, the shallower part is the part we see the ripples. Where we see the ripples? Ripples that are created by the undulations of the stone, stones beneath, and ripples which in turn thrust downward into the sandy or stony bed of the stream and restructure the stream bed itself. We see here the imprint of water as it flows across sand, capturing the ripples in sand like a fingerprint. These fingerprints are the memory of water that have been traced and imprinted and preserved in whatever medium is flowing in the water and the water is flowing over. This is the language of water as it forms organic, rhythmic, and lasting shapes in whatever material it encounters. This is the way that water creates organic shapes in all instances of its flowing. These are small organic shapes, tree-like, frond-like, small on a beach made from small pebbles of sand, vastly larger in a river delta but we can see it as the flow of the water itself that establishes trunk, branch, limb, twig, and finally leaves. And the tree itself, or the plant itself, becomes an expression of the natural flow and diversification and spreading of the force coursing through the water. Thus it is in our bodies. And there is a third aspect of the language of water. Water is the perfect transmitter of all forms of vibration. Whatever taps the side of a vessel sends a vibratory ripple through every molecule of water contained within that vessel. If we push it on a water balloon, that pressure is immediately dispersed throughout the entire inner surface of that water balloon and every vibration is sent rippling through the entire container and vibrates the entire containing skin. Again, to touch the surface of something like ourselves, big water balloons, we stir the depths. And every one of our therapeutic contacts sets currents, deposits, vibrations, and the flow of the information and the memory of water into action. I'd like to look next at the tissue that is the container of our water balloon. It is holding all this water together into this package we call our organisms. Two of the main features of connective tissue, in my experience, have, are that it is both the web of structure that holds all of our pieces and parts together, and it is a web of chi, a highly energetic, electromagnetically conducting substance that spreads not only the vibrations of water, but the streams of electrons and electromagnetic current throughout our entire interior. I want to look at a moment of what I call a mandala of connective tissue. We can see that all the systems on the outside, hemostatic, reproductive, immune, lymphatic, respiratory, and so on, are all encapsulated within their connective tissue structures and all connected 
to one another through the enmeshing connective tissue, tissue structure that holds all of them together into a single organism. So the connective tissue on this structural level is doing two very interesting, seemingly opposite things. It is separating all of our cells and organs into their own discrete locations and entities, entities, and it is also binding all of those entities and cells together into a unified whole, not only structurally, but energetically. Every one of these crisscrossing lines within the mandala is part of the web, the matrix of connective tissue that is, among other things, a very efficient conductor of electro electromagnetic energy. It is a conductor of electromagnetic energy of a very special sort called piezoelectric. Piezo is a word deriving from the Greek meaning self-generating. What this means in terms of the kinds of substances that we call piezoelectric is that when they are distorted with pressure or with traction, as uh, <clears throat> imaged by the bone picture on the left showing force lines as a result of compression or stretch going through the structure of the bone and the contactive tissue that makes up the bone, we find electrical poles being developed within all those black and white bands, positive on one side, negative on the other. And of course, when we have a positive and a negative pole developing, in, the, in a substance that conduct electron uh, streams of electromagnetic energy, we generate a current that runs through the entire structure. This is to say that every pressure, every movement, every vibration that courses through our water, courses through our connective tissue, creates piezoelectricity, and sends off cascades of chi throughout our body and throughout every living cell. Connective tissue fibers are molecules that have been spun out of specialized cells called fibroblasts. These molecules collect in the streams of water surrounding the cell and are compacted together into organized strands. These strands band together to become fibrils. These fibrils weave together to become the planes and surfaces and bags and containers of connective tissue that hold our body and our cells together. Connective tissue itself has a memory and a responsiveness to the forces at play upon it. What we're looking at here is a photograph of a petri dish with an artificially grown collection of uh, fibroblasts forming the meshwork on top of the petri dish. The white band at the bottom has been where the uh, experimenter has put a little probe into the petri dish and tugged that mesh, that matrix of connective tissue fibers, towards one side. The stress that goes through that mesh has created an increasing deposit of collagen molecules and collagen fibrils and connective tissue matrix that becomes thicker and stronger precisely where the stress has been applied. This is the memory of connective tissue. And it is one way that every motion, every stress, every response of our body becomes recorded in our tissue. All of this connective tissue then becomes divided into compartment within compartment within compartment, containing in this picture the entirety of our thigh, containing within that thigh muscles that make up the thigh. At the heart of that thigh, packages that hold the bone in place. And within those packages, tubular packages that hold all my nerves and blood vessels into place. All connective tissue, all structural, all electric. Here's a cross section of a muscle sac. We can see the fine little septa of connective tissue that weave themselves in from the outer shell of the uh, muscle sac into the interior of the muscle forming long tubes that hold the muscle cells into specific vectors that become specific lines of contraction and elongation that organize the action of the muscle cells. If we look a little deeper, 
we will find between the muscle cells, which are the red tubes on either side of the picture, a finer and finer matrix of collagen fibrils, structural and electric, that connect the membranes of all muscle cells together and send energy in between the muscle cells as they work and distort the connective tissue meshwork between them, creating piezoelectricity. All of these matrix lines and matrix sacs and matrix planes of connective tissue knit our bones together and knit our muscles to our bones and make us a little spring box of tensegrity that holds our uh, uh, organism together not only into a blob but into a springy shape, a responsive shape, an active shape. Any force that comes into that tensegrity structure of our body responds to that force, whether it be elongation or, or compression or vibration. This picture is a picture of a simple tensegrity structure. The solid lines are solid spacer bars. The dotted lines are elastic bands that hold the spacer bars together. Note that none of the spacer bars, bars touch one another. They are just held dynamically in place in space and in gravity by the tension of the elastic bands. The elastic rubber within the band corresponds to the shortening and contracting capacity of our muscles. The wrapping that surrounds those rubber bands and makes it elastic correspond to the con connective tissue structures that are surrounding our muscles and inserting into the spacer bars of our bones. And when we compress this structure, that compressive force travels through the entire structure. When we elongate this structure, that elongating force travels through the entire structure, changing the shape and the tension lines of everything within and generating piezoelectricity on its way. There are finer filaments that come off of my connective tissue structures. The dark lines at the top are uh, representations of collagen fibrils. Connected to those collagen fibrils are finer chains of molecules that go down and connect to cells buried in the cell membrane, the dotted line that is uh, running across the middle of our picture. Those molecules that are contacted by the finer matrix coming from the connective tissue connect to the internal matrix, the cytoskeleton of the cell, which fill the cell with a mesh, much like connective tissue but finer which go all the way down to the nucleus of the cell, contact membrane molecules in the nuclear membrane, and become coextensive with meshes of fiber all the way into the nucleus and holding and reacting with the DNA buried inside. All of this mesh is flexible, and every time any part of the mesh flexes, it generates energy. This is a lovely staining of the matrix of a neuron. Again, we can see the matrix, the, skytos, the cytoskeleton of the neuron, is what gives it its specific shape. But the little strands we see coming off the surface of the neuron membrane, again, go out to connect to this outer meshwork that ultimately connects with connective tissue. And all is set into electromagnetic motion and energy by every movement and every vibration of our organism. There are many researchers who now feel that this may be the key to understanding the way acupuncture meridians work. Acupunct acupuncture meridians are the line of least resistance in the electrical flow through the matrix. There are the Jing meridians, which we see in our normal pictures of acupuncture meridian mappings, the vertical line. There are outbranching meridians, the Luo horizontal meridians, that then branch out into finer and finer lines of least resistance to the energetic flow coursing through the connective tissue, ultimately connecting with cells, as we see on the right-hand side of the illustration, ultimately penetrating cells all the way to the nucleus and feeding energy and information to every living cell that is surrounded by this connective tissue matrix, all harmonizing in the dance of life through this flow of information. 
we come to another special molecule that is coursing throughout our body a rather recent discovery in the last 20 years or so and whose discoveries have been accelerating at an astonishing pace even in the last year, the neuropeptides. Neuropeptides are messenger molecules. They are manufactured by all of our brain cells and many, many of our tissue cells throughout our body. Cells manufacture them and send them out where they go into the circulatory system and bond to the membranes of other cells and change the function of those cells to which they bond. Again, the neuropeptide system is a vast mandala within our, within our organisms. All of the organs in the outside circle of circles create and receive neuropeptide messenger cells. All of them send messages, all of them receive messages, and all of them are talking to one another through this crosstalk, again illustrated by the meshwork of the mandala within, to be talking to each other now not through neural transmission lines, not through connective tissue transmission lines, but through chemical transmission lines that are circulating in our blood and all of our intercellular fluids. When these were first discovered, they thought that it was very exciting and uh, the first connections that they made were the psychoneuroimmunological -neuro connections. That is, psycho, meaning our mental states, are connected to our neuronal activity, which are connected to, it turns out, the robustness and the activity and responsiveness of our immune system. Now we know it is far more complex than that. Here is a picture of a uh, <clears throat> computer simulation of a neuropeptide, the little object on top, that is being drawn into a dock, like a lock into a key, on the cell membrane that is the horizontal structure in the bottom half of the picture. Molecular forces guide that neuropeptide into its membrane dock. And when that neuropeptide finds its membrane dock, as we see five examples of in this illustration from my notebook, very interesting things start to happen. You can see embedded within the membrane, again the circles and squiggly lines, are a variety of receptor molecules that are specifically attuned to capture the energy of specific neuropeptides, the green to its receptor, the red to its receptor, the blue to its, and so on. Every different neuropeptide has a different receptor molecule in the cell membrane, and when it docks into that specific receptor molecule, it sets that molecule into vibration, which emanates that energetic vibration into the interior of the cell, sending the message of that external neuropeptide molecule into the interior of the cell and materially changing the biological function of that cell. Cells are constantly changing the populations of neuropeptide receptors on their surfaces. Cells are constantly sending out new neuropeptides based on their function with the rest of the body. Cells are constantly receiving different neuropeptides which stimulate them to react to different orchestrated bodily needs throughout my organ system and throughout all energy systems that are coursing through my body. All of it information, all of it informing cells, all of it giving powers the cells the power to inform other cells, and all of it creating the incredibly complex symphony that we call our life force. Tides are produced and received by all brain cells. They are particularly dense in our limbic system, our brain's center of feelings. Here is the connection between our emotional lives and our biological, physiological health. These neuropeptides are also produced and received by many, if not all, of the body's tissues. In this sense, all cells are glands exuding chemical packets of information that trigger activities on all their target cells. It's important to understand 
that these messenger molecules do not simply stimulate feelings. Their orchestration are, are our feelings that manifest in every process of our organisms, including our immune strength, our physiological harmony, our homeostasis, our digestion, our wound healing, our immune response, and all the rest of it. What does this mean for body work? When we change the feeling state in a client for the better, for the calmer, for the more open, for the more receptive, we are unleashing a flood of neuropeptides that goes throughout the system, contact cells with the message of calm down, become receptive, pay attention, cooperate with your neighbors, liver cooperate with stomach, stomach cooperate with colon, and so on down the line. This I think is probably what is meant by negative emotions. They are emotions that send the system into disarray and positive emotions. They are emotions of well-being, calm, attentiveness, and receptiveness to the reality of the situation, which gives our organism the power to adapt. So our consciousness is not regulated by switches and circuitry. Our consciousness is a flow born, born upon all the fluid and energetic currents within us, orchestrating the symphony that is our life. The primary effects of body work the language of therapeutic touch, our positive changes in feeling states, and the freeing of circulation, which distributes the physiology of these feeling states throughout our organisms. The primary results are heightened self-awareness, improved self-regulation, and more successful adaptation to the circumstances of our lives. Mind is not what brain does. Mind is what the orchestration of every molecule in our body does. Mind is the flow of energy. Energy flowing in our bodies is physiology. All physiology is the flow of information. That flow of information is our consciousness. And consciousness is our life. So from energy currents we become, we come from, energy currents we become, energy currents we capture into our structures and utilize in our lives and our beings, energy currents from the cosmos, from the planet, all of which look very similar in their fundamental fractal makeup. Energy currents that are captured by the fetus and shape its developing cells into specific organs, specific limbs, specific body parts, and specific species. Currents that both create and are created by the organs that they have produced and animate every aspect of our being through acupuncture meridians, through circulatory tubing, through neuronal nervous system networks, through vibratory networks, through movement, through sensation, through feeling, and through touch. What we are animating as we address our clients in this therapeutic negotiation of the moment from a past into the possibility of a present into the unfolding of a potentially very new future are surfing, riding, playing with, feeling, acknowledging, and responding to the currents that flow between us. and flowing out of us. We are wrinkles in the stream of energy 
forming, gelling, and passing in the lifetime of our tissues. until we dissolve into the stream once again. And in that stream of our lifetime, growth is the memory of the body. Memory is the growth of the mind. Mind is the freedom from deterministic repetition afforded by the growth of memory. Our karma is the momentum of mind that has been created by our past. And you can forget it. You're never going to have a better past. That is the memory of what we have done and what we have been. But grace is the movement of mind toward our future. The potential in the touch of flesh with flesh is the bridging between these worlds of time. The awareness of what we have been what we are now, and what we may possibly become if we embrace the possibility of change. And that is the content of the therapeutic moment. Working through all systems, transducing all forms of information, and transforming information into all forms of forms, and creating us moment by moment, day by day, year by year, as we live our lives. So I think now, Brian, uh, the floor is open for questions. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you. I feel like I've been on a journey. A very uh, profound presentation. Thank you so much. So a few folks have written in. Um, there was a question in the beginning. You talked about uh, standing water breeds pestilence, moving water, and then they, they missed it. They wanted to see if you can get some clarification on that. Uh, yes. Uh, well, uh, standing water, like a pond, like a swamp, like a sponge, becomes the breeding ground hmm. for all kinds of nasty organisms that uh, uh, form the stagnation of that standing water. Moving water is continually flushing that sponge, continually flushing our organism, continually flushing that stream, folding in oxygen, carrying off debris, and carrying off the, uh, the collection of moss, algae, bacteria, what have you. So it's, it is the movement and the circulation and the continual resurgence of water in and out of our cells, in and out of our organisms that is the cleansing factor. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Beautiful. You also talked about uh, the beginning, the past, present, and future. Uh, that quote, is that in either of your books, Dean? Um, I just came up with that yesterday. Beautiful. I like how your <laughs> stream of consciousness, that works. Will you be writing a, a new book in the future? I am... Uh Cogitating my way towards that, what I, what I uh, really am trying to come up with is a way to capture Job's body and the journey that we've just been on in a way that is more accessible to uh, the average reader and not a specialized audience of body workers who are willing to dig into the uh, arcane science of it all and understand mm -hmm. it on that level. But, why would I, Joe Blow, walking down the street, coping with my life, want to know about all this stuff because it might help me? Absolutely. Very good. Dean, you were talking about uh, chi, and Matthew's wondering if you're affiliating chi as piezoelectricity. Ah, good question, and I knew that would come up. What I to do is limit it to the flow of piezoelectricity. What I mean to suggest is, in my mind, that flow of piezoelectricity is a significant component of this energy that we absorb from the universe and utilize within ourselves that we call chi. Neuropeptide uh, streams of information and energy is also a part of that chi. 
fluid circulation of our water is a part of that chi. Our uh, response of our body to vibration and, and uh, intake and output of that vibration is a part of chi. So just like I would, don't want to say mind is brain, I don't want to say piezo electricity is chi, mm. but it is a piece of it, and I significant piece of it because when we let that connective tissue matrix become idle and dormant, don't exercise it, don't move it, don't renew it, don't add continually replenished memories and possibilities to its matrix. The system just begins energetically winding down, and we experience what I may call a, a loss of a significant significant part of our chi. Right. Well said. Well said. Uh, Albion sent in a quote, freeing the body eventually leads to freeing the heart. And that ties into another question we had about heart math uh, and their research and tools. Can you comment on the role of the heart as kind of a director? Well, yes. This, this branches off into my, uh, uh, or, or turns itself into my point of mind is not simply what the brain is doing. And of course, the heart, like all collections of cells, like all individual cells, is an intelligence entity all of its own. We've gotten into a terrible muddle thinking that basically intelligence has to do with the interpretation of symbols which negates most of the forms of intelligence that living, uh, living creatures have manifested for many, many, many eons and millions of generations. All that heart math research I find extremely pregnant with suggestion of what an, an organ like the heart may be adding to that assembly of information that we finally ultimately either in the field of awareness and call consciousness. And the heart, I think, has a special role. This has been manifested by theories of the heart from time immemorial, from the Eastern teachers to the Western teachers to Jesus to the New Age to what have you. Let me, let me tie it in with what I was saying about the energy of, of muscularity and movement and connective tissue by saying that the heart is a, a a major pump of piezoelectricity throughout our entire system. It is a muscle that is rhythmically distorting the connective tissue that holds it together. And the connective tissue that holds the heart together is connected through the circulatory system out into every precinct of, of our uh, internal organism. And it is not just the pulse of the heart, but the pulse of all that circulatory tubing that is in sync with the heart that becomes one of the primary rhythms of all 60 trillion cells that make us up. And I think the Heart Math uh, Institute is really just on, on the very edge of beginning to discover what the ultimate significance is of all those rhythms, all those energies, and all those synchronies uh, really have to say in terms of playing a role, not only in physiological health, not only in resistance to disease, but in our emotional lives, our cognitive lives, and our spiritual lives. Absolutely. Well, we're at the top of the hour. I'd like to take one more question, Dean, and then I have some follow-up slides. In your opinion, how do you feel or why do you feel that reaching the mind is such a crucial part of body work? Well, as uh, my... Uh, teacher Milton Traeger used to say, the mind's the whole thing. If what we understand by mind is the various levels and forms of intelligence that inform 60 trillion cells to somehow hang together and act in harmony and synchrony in such a way that sustains any person's life force, if we don't reach the informational, the vibrational, the molecular, the energetic level of that organization, what have we done except tweak a, tweak a screw or bend a rod here or there? Tweaking the screw and bending the rod has really no lasting significance for the organism unless it impacts that organism with information that gives it the capacity to take a renewed level of self-awareness 
into a renewed power of self-regulation and apply those two into a renewed capacity for adaptation for whatever circumstances it finds itself in. We can tinker with this tissue or that tissue all we, all we want, but if we do not in some way impact the conscious, informed, and intelligently responsive capacities of the organism as a whole, I don't see how we're doing anything other than just tweaking it here and there and hope things work out. Mm. Very well said and a, a beautiful summation. Uh, I think that's a, a great place to end. Uh, Dean, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was phenomenal. And as I said earlier, very profound, a beautiful journey. Uh, I think you get the award for the most beautiful presentation, the most artistic for sure, and, uh, and poetic presentation. It was very inspiring. Thank well, you, thank, thank you, you very much. It's, yeah. it's been a, per, a pleasure to work with you, Brian, and a privilege to be on air with all of you out there. Thank okay. you very much. Great. Yeah, we hope to work with you more in the future. Oh, I think that's a given. <laughs> okay, great. Well, listen, Dean, you're welcome to stay on. I have a few uh, closing slides. I want to show people how to get to our online education center so they can watch the webinar again and also get their continuing education credit. So you're very welcome to stay on or you can leave. And for those sure, folks... Sure, no, I'll, I'd like to see all that information. Okay, great. And, uh, will, that just, will that pop up automatically on my screen or do yeah, I need I'm, to clear I'm my keynote? Yeah, I'm going to actually take back control and put... Okay. Um, my screen up, so I'll do that right here. There we go. Okay, good. So this is our online education center logo. We talked a bit about it in the beginning. And the easiest way to get there, you just go to abmp.com and you a couple boxes up here. You can see you put in your member ID number and your password. And if you're not a member, I'm going to show you how to access it as well. So from there, you'll be given this screen. You just click on the Online Education Center right here. That will mm -hmm. take you to what we call our home page for the Online Education Center. You just click on View Webinars, that box there. And that's going to give you a whole list. We've got 41 webinars uh, posted so far. All right. Yeah, and you just click on this highlighted one here, and that will you can actually watch the webinar again. Uh, it won't be posted. This particular webinar will be posted probably by Thursday, Friday at the latest. Um, it can is non-members, non-members who don't have a password have access to. Yes, and I'll show you how to do that. Yep. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. This, uh, if this you, I want my. This I want for my web for sure. Okay, great. Uh, if you would like to purchase the quiz which gives you the one CE hour. You take the quiz and then you fill out a brief survey and you can print your CE certificate uh, right from the page. You just click on this box here, purchase the quiz at $12 for members, and that will take you to a checkout system right here. So you just enter your credit card information and walk through that. That will take you to this screen and you just click on My Courses and Quizzes. That's where all the, so if you take a course or a webinar, the quizzes or the test will be under this one. So for this particular instance, we'll click on webinar quizzes and then this link will be highlighted. You just click on test. Mm -hmm. If you're not a member, this is to answer your question, you go to our homepage, www.abmp.com and you'll see this box over here, ABMP Education Center, Online Education Center. Uh -huh. Click there. That'll take you to this screen and you can see down here, not an ABMP member. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping that's showing up. Yeah. Yep. And you click there, and that will take you to a login page. You will be if you've never done it, and it's your first time. Uh, it will ask you to enter an email address and a password. So it's basically setting up an account with the online education uh -huh. center, which you can visit at any point. Then. So same thing. Once you set that account up, you'll go to view webinars, and then um, go on as you did before. So again, I, I encourage you to check them out. There are currently 10 courses, as I said, 40-some webinars. Fantastic resource for members, and if you're uh, not a member, you want more information, please give us a call. We're at 800-458-2267.
I want to alert you to our next webinar for professionals. It's Using Research to Market Your Massage Therapy Practice. And that's with Laura Allen. Do I have that written up there? No, I don't. I made this sl uh, slide right before the webinar. So that's Laura Allen there. She's on the East Coast. You'll probably from, be familiar with some of her books, those of you that have been around a while. That'll be February 15th, 6 p.m. Mountain. Uh, we'll be sending invitations out later this week, so look for those in your email box. And last but not least, we would like to thank you. This is our group here at ABMP. We've got 48 professionals dedicated to serving you, uh, eight alone in the education department, bringing you these webinars, instructor workshops, and a host of materials for uh, students, instructors, and schools, and professionals. So thank you from our heart for allowing us to serve you. We thank you for tuning in tonight. And Dean, phenomenal. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, my pleasure, and thank you all. OK, and Leslie, if you're still around, thanks for introducing Dean. Um, and if you haven't read you're Dean's welcome. article yet, oh, she is still there. Great. And if you haven't read Dean's article yet, please pick up the latest copy of Massage and Bodywork magazine. Okay, everyone, good night, and thank you again.